Those of you who have listened to the first uh, lecture on Jan Potochka may remember that he opens his heretical essays with several pages on a problem uh, formulated by a now forgotten German philosopher, Richard Avenarius. There is a problem with what Avenarius called the human world concept, and the problem is this. The remoteness of the world of our life from the world described by mathematical physics compels us to ask whether these worlds can be reconciled. Unlike Avenarius, Potochka is doubtful. Uh, the problem of the world, he concludes, appears to us to be unsolvable. As I tried to show in the first lecture, it is the unresolved question of the world that orients Potochka's uh, reflection on the origins of history. Potochka suggests in his first essay that history only begins with the practice of questioning. He means by this not the appearance of question asking in a formal uh, linguistic sense, but a human practice uh, of questioning which places the world itself and as a whole in question. A, f uh, a human practice which takes um, its task from the question of the world in its most basic form, the question being what is the world? If we grant Potochka's conjecture that history only begins with a methodical practice of questioning the world in which the world in which humans find themselves, the theme of his first essay, then it becomes necessary to ask when, where, and why did this practice of questioning arise? And that basically is the theme of his second essay titled The Beginning of History, and of this our, our second lecture on the heretical essays. Part one is titled uh, The First Empires and Their Writing Cultures. Now I want to open this lecture as the last with Potochka's comments on the work of a now forgotten German philosopher. This time I'm thinking of Oskar Becker, who died in 1964, so roughly a decade before Potochka wrote his heretical essays. Like Potochka in the 1930s, Oskar Becker had come under the influence of Edmund Husserl, who was a Czech philosopher of Jewish descent. And um, unfortunately, uh, Becker's uh, connection to Husserl did not prevent him from making a full-throated avowal of uh, Nazi ideology during the Nazi Zeit, um, as his uh, SS dossier reads. Why does Becker's lapse into National Socialist ideology not prevent Potochka from reading him or us from discussing him tonight? In the first place, the text of Becker's that interests Potochka is dated to the year 1932, so on the cusp of Hitler's rise to power in 1933. But not only is Becker's text written before Hitler seized control, but this text appeared in French, not in German, in the pages of a Parisian journal. Much more could be said, but these, given these scant and varied indications, I think it's permissible for us to bracket Becker's failings during the Nazi Zeit and simply to concern ourselves, as does Potochka, with a three-phase typology of civilizations, which Becker advanced in his 1932 article. Potochka notes that Becker's typology of civilizations is not dissimilar to his own. And this is, of course, what makes it interesting for us. There are critical differences between their typologies, though, which will help us to see more clearly in the coming minutes how and why Potochka thinks of the origin of history in the counterintuitive or heretical uh, way that he does. For his part, Becker thought that global history could be meaningfully divided into uh, three formations, those he calls uh, basal civilizations, uh, which have spoken language but no writing, lower civilizations, which have both language and writing, um, and a consciousness of human freedom, and historical civilizations which are oriented in vastly differing ways to the, the active unfolding of human freedom. For his part, Potochka offers uh, a number of comments on Becker's basic typology. 
A basal civilization is one in which there is both language and tool usage, but as I've already uh, pointed out, no writing. It is a civilization in which language itself has not yet become a materialized tool of civilization in the form of writing. Importantly for Becker, as Patochka reads him, both language and tool usage expand humans' temporal horizons. Humans' recollections of the past and anticipations of the future are rendered more diverse and more complex, both by speech and by customs of sustained labor. Nevertheless, the horizons of Becker's basal civilizations uh, or the horizon, rather, of Becker's basal civilizations is the cyclical task of merely sustaining life. We may recall uh, that this is what Potochka calls in his first essay, the bondage of life to itself. And we may conclude that for both philosophers, life in human collectives, which lack writing, is radically unfree. It is with the second phase of Becker's typology that Patochka begins to diverge from him. For Becker held that we can observe an intrusion of freedom in human consciousness in the lower civilizations, lower so-called uh, throughout, I'm of course uh, simply uh, using Becker's terminology. Patochka is unconvinced in part, I think, because his idea of freedom is not the same as Becker's. A human consciousness of its own freedom for evil is what intrigues Becker. Becker stresses the awareness of guilt that shows up in Genesis and in Babylonian poetry. According to him, texts of ancient Egypt and Israel, Babylonia and Persia, India and China bear witness to an intrusion of a freedom to evil and thus a new passion, a new dimension of passion and guilt in human history. A world historical break with primordial humanity, uh, humanity before writing, thus occurs in the second phase of Becker's typology, that is in the, wall, in the walled cities and sacred empires of deep antiquity. For Becker, this intrusion of freedom predates Greek literary culture by many centuries, as we will see in a moment, Patochka disagrees. But Becker's and Patochka's typologies of history seem to reconverge in Becker's third phase, namely the historical age proper, in which, as Patochka puts it, the principal theme is the unfolding of the possibility basic to human beings. Now, that is a highly abstract formulation, so it's necessary for us to ask, what is the possibility basic to human beings whose unfolding constitutes the principal theme of history. Precisely that is Patochka's question in the second essay and ours in this lecture. Patochka believes that humankind's innermost possibility is freedom. This means that for him, the principal theme of history is the unfolding of human freedom. And what we could then ask is human freedom for? I've just alluded to the fact that for many ancient myth cycles, including the narrative of the fall in Genesis, human freedom can be grasped as being most essentially a freedom for evil. Is that then the principal theme of history according to Patochka? Well, it is not. Rather, Patochka's startling conclusion towards the end of his second essay is that freedom in the end is freedom for truth. Naturally, if the principal theme of history for both Becker and Patochka is the unfolding of humankind's basic possibility, and if that basic possibility for both philosophers is human freedom, then we might expect that Patochka would accept Becker's typology of history. What determines Patochka's disagreement with Becker, his divergence, I think, is this notion, which I've just uh, adumbrated, the notion that freedom is freedom for truth. In contrast, for Becker, freedom seems originally to be a freedom for good and evil. Uh, to echo the name of the eerie tree in the first scenes of Genesis, which is, of course, um, called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It is a moral freedom which brings with it, in Becker's article, three new phenomena. The first is an intrusion of sensual passion in human life. The second is a lust 
for domination between humans and human collectives. In the Latin of St. Augustine, this is libido dominandi. And the third is a human awareness of guilt. Since Becker thinks he can find this triad of erotic desire, a drive for conquest, and acute feelings of guilt in the first pages of Genesis, say, and in the fragmentary epic of Gilgamesh, he believes that he can glimpse the intrusion of freedom in these cities and empires of deep antiquity. But Patochka differs in his conception of freedom, where the intrusion of freedom is a moral phenomenon for Becker, as I've tried to indicate. It is an intellectual phenomenon for Patochka, though it is an intellectual phenomenon which brings with it a profoundly moral form of self-recognition. To repeat, freedom for Jan Patochka is freedom for truth, and that means that it is a freedom to question. What Becker sought in ancient texts was evidence of guilt feelings. He found them, and he dated human freedom back to the lower civilizations, so-called, in the second phase of his typology. What Patochka sought in archaic, archaic texts, by way of contrast, was evidence of freedom to question. He failed to find this in Gilgamesh or uh, in Genesis, and he uh, therefore was led to deny that uh, so-called lower civilizations were historical civilizations. They had writing, to be sure, but they did not have a practice of questioning. And thus they lacked, to Patochka's mind, the only freedom which constitutes history, namely a freedom for truth. Patochka only finds this freedom, the freedom for truth, by way of questioning in a constellation of texts which date back to the zone of influence of the first democratic Greek cities. For Patochka then, because history is constituted by freedom, because freedom, the, because the freedom in question is a freedom uh, for truth, and because truth can only be approached by methodical questioning, and finally, because a methodical practice of questioning is first evidenced, according to Patochka, in texts from a democratic zone in ancient Greece, Patochka holds that history begins in the democratic zone of ancient Greece. But this returns us to a question we touched upon in the first lecture and that Patochka touches upon uh, in, in uh, his first essay, namely this, if history doesn't begin with writing, then why do we have writings um, from a time before history? Isn't that what history is, an archive of writings about the past or human life in time. And it is undeniable that we have writings about the past that antedate Greek philosophy by centuries. A hundred other texts could be mentioned, but we will limit ourselves to Homer and Hesiod, Gilgamesh and Genesis, all of which are writings about the past. In light of such questions, um, Patochka sketches a critique of the earliest writing cultures in his second essay. What Patochka calls history is a singular conception of freedom, and he denies that the technique of writing was originally devised to advance or unfold that freedom, the freedom for truth and its method, which for Patochka is questioning. On the contrary, he says, um, Archaic writing and its transmission indicates what Patochka calls a will to conscious preservation. Writing is not originally devised as a support for abstract enquiry or doubt-driven reflection. Rather, it is an instrument of petrified memory. In the era dominated by what Becker calls the lower civilizations, Patochka says that writing is nothing but, quote, a new, extremely effective medium for the petrification of life forms. The most ancient writing cultures are not inspired by a task of questioning the whole, a task which comes to be called in a later Greek vocabulary philosophy, but rather by the will to immutable tradition, the will to permanence. Writing is not originally cultivated because affixing signs and symbols to stone walls or bronze panels, wax tablets or inked papyri can inspire questioning. On the contrary, writing is prized in the first writing cultures because it can end questioning. 
and can bestow on human sayings the duration of stone or of bronze. It is this idea of Patochka's, namely that writing originates in a certain sort of human resistance to history that leads him to describe something that he calls in his second essay, the curious phenomenon of an ahistorical history, a historical narrative without a history. Now, what could that mean? A historical narrative without a history is a writing about the past that is not concerned with truth or the freedom for truth, namely questioning, but rather with what Patochka calls mere life. A historical history is nothing but an artifact of life made firm, of humanity subjected to subservience to life. He calls this sort of writing analytics, and he comments at some length, quote, Analytics captures the past as something important for the successful future comportment of the grand household, by which he means the archaic city or empire. It is primarily composed of ritualistic writings, cultomantic records, observations of what is fortunate and unfortunate in events and acts. As long as humans live in such a way that this vital acceptance and transmission of the preservation and securing of life exhausts the meaning of what is done, we can say that it moves in the rhythm of perennial return. Of course, perennial return is a counter concept to history here. For Patochka, Hesiod's Theogony, say, or Homer's Odyssey, belong to a tradition of historical narrative without an actual history. The reason for this being that their purpose and meaning was the preservation of a humanity whose life meaning was given and prescribed, which is another way of saying mythic. But if the earliest human texts belong not to history, but to the Sisyphean cycle of perennial return, in other words, if Patochka's idea of freedom for truth cannot be found in the lower civilizations of Becker's typology, then where do human texts begin to contribute to what Patochka calls history? Well, in the democratic zone of ancient Greece, in the 5th century before the Christian era, as I have already uh, indicated more than once. So the time has come to answer the question, why? Why do texts emanating from 5th century BCE Greece both reflect and inculcate a practice of questioning without which there could be no freedom for truth, and thus for Patochka, no history? Part 2, Philosophy and the First Democratic Cities. We've just read that analytics captures the past as something important for the successful future comportment of the grand household. It is critical to note that Patochka calls the first human cities and empires in his second uh, essay, Households. He means for his readers to remember something that I only very briefly mentioned in the first lecture, and that is that he defines a grand household in the first essay as uh, an unequal society of gods and humans. In the archaic world picture, the city, the empire, and the world comprise one house within which it is gods who consign humans to the fate of death. Archaic cities and empires understood themselves to be and to reveal something that is not the work of humans. The obligation of anyone born into a grand household, whether we think of that as an archaic family, city, or empire, is calmly to accept the unfree life that is given to them as their lot. The grand household therefore serves Patochka as the world picture and as the myth of politics, of a humanity for whom the world belongs to the gods. What he means to suggest is that the first human cities and empires were not cities or empires, not in our sense of those words. They were, in their own eyes, merely grand households. They were believed to uh, mirror and magnify the unequal society of human families within the household of the gods, that is, the world. 
It is this claim about archaic cities not being cities that leads Patochka to make a formally similar claim about archaic histories not being histories. The first human cities and empires, which were not cities or empires, in Patochka's mind, generated the first forms of historical writing, which were not forms of historical writing in Patochka's mind. Rather, according to Patochka, our earliest writings about the past are only, uh, only a test to a sort of a historical history. To briefly re reprise, Patochka holds that the unequal society of gods and humans is un incapable of giving rise to true cities or to true history. And he holds that archaic cities, which are pictured by their inhabitants as both human and divine households, such cities are fated to remain within the unfreedom of natural cyclicity. This brings us to the Greeks and to the Greek word for city, which is polis. For Patochka writes that although life in the polis initially unfolds on the necessary foundation of the family, oikos, the house or the household, uh, the Greek democratic cities relativize the unequal society of the household and seek to realize, quote, a new human possibility based on the mutual recognition of humans as free and equal, a recognition which must be continuously acted out, in which activity does not have the character of enforced toil, but rather the manifestation of excellence, demonstrating that in which humans can be, in principle, equal in competition with each other. The unfreedom of natural cyclicity, in Patochka's phrase, was first transcended by a Greek culture of the free manifestation of excellence, in contrast to archaic toil or a culture of acceptance. And the divine household myth of cities and empires in deep antiquity was first transformed by a common recognition among humans that they could be equal in competition rather than equal in subjection to the world generating powers, the gods. Patochka stresses the structural realizations of freedom and equality in the first Greek democratic cities without forgetting that human freedom is ultimately for him, as we have heard, a freedom for truth, and that this freedom can only be experienced through a practice of questioning. There is therefore a double presence of questioning in Patochka's description of the first democratic cities. In the first place, the democratic city, a city that belongs in novel ways to the free equals who inhabit it, this city is an effect of questioning, namely of a concrete questioning of the archaic world picture by venturing a new form of the city. In the second place, the democratic picture of the city is a cause of questioning, namely of an abstract questioning of the archaic world picture by constituting a cultural zone and a cultural moment within which philosophical questioning could arise. In other words, the first democratic cities both reflect and inculcate a form of questioning with which history can begin. Patochka writes this, Life in the polis, political life at a stroke, confronts humans with the possibility of life as a totality. Philosophical life grafts itself to this trunk and brings forth what is enclosed within it. Perhaps from these reflections we could deduce the very beginning of history in the proper sense of the word. It is from the democratic polis that Patochka seeks to deduce in his second essay, the very beginning of history. Oscar Becker and others who see the origins of history in the writing cultures of ancient Egypt or Babylonia are, on Patochka's telling, mistaken. Patochka says that, quote, the great empires represent an essential propedeutic for a different conception of life's meaning, but he does not think that they realize a different conception of life's meaning. 
what Patochka calls history only begins with what he calls a new way of being human in the democratic cities of ancient Greece. And it is philosophy that unfolds the potential for questioning, for freedom, for truth that is enclosed within the first ventures in Greek democracy. What is this secret kinship, though, we must ask, that Patochka sees or wishes to see between Greek democracy and philosophy? He, of course, knows that the Platonic tradition, which he places at the very heart of the Western world and its spirit, in his phrase, is critical of the first democratic regimes. It was a democratic city that put Socrates to death. What then is the truth Patochka thinks is enclosed within the first Greek democracies? What is the democratic truth that Socrates and his protege Plato, and in later centuries countless other philosophers of the Platonic Christian tradition, are thought to have unfolded? There are two words that Patochka introduces in his second essay which sharpen our understanding of the freedom and questioning which tie philosophy to Greek democracy and which tie both uh, philosophy and democracy to the origins of history as such. One word is unsheltered and the other is wonder. Inasmuch as philosophy and democracy are free, they are unsheltered. And it is an opening of the mind that engenders a new feeling of wonder and with it philosophy. Plato compares this opening in one of his most dramatic texts to the perilous ascent out of a cave. And this is Patochka in the passage I have in mind. Quote, a free life as such, one's own or that of others, is essentially an unsheltered life. Such life does not seek to escape its contingency, but neither does it yield to it passively. Since it has glimpsed the possibility of authentic life, the world opens itself to it for the first time. Nothing of, this, of the earlier archaic life of acceptance remains in peace. All the traditions and myths are equally shaken. It is like a landscape illuminated by lightning amid which humans stand alone with no support, relying solely on that which presents itself, and that which presents itself is everything without exception. It is the moment of creative dawning. If Plato and Aristotle are right in saying that thauma or tauma archetes sophias, wonder is the beginning of wisdom. Patochka is convinced that Plato and Aristotle are right in saying wonder is the beginning of wisdom. And he glosses their fulgurous saying with this new saying of his own, quote, the lover of myths is a philosopher in a way, though he will be one only if he seeks to awaken a sense of wonder, of awe over what actually is, for the wonder of being is no fable. We can see from this that, although philosophy and democracy are placed by Patochka on a landscape on which humans stand alone, relying solely on that which presents itself, one of the things which presents itself to humans on this lightning-struck landscape is myth. For Patochka, neither philosophy nor democracy negates the presence of myth or indeed of religion. He makes this very clear in a sentence that itself refers to a miraculous scene or myth in the New Testament. Patochka writes this, quote, Scales fell from the eye, fall from the eyes of those set free. He's, of course, recollecting the scales that fall from the eyes of uh, St. Paul or Paul of Tarsus after Jesus appears to him on a road in Roman Syria. But this is Patochka. Scales fall from the eyes of those set free, not that they might see something new, but that they might see in a new way. Even myth and religion come to be seen in a new way, 
after the first lightning bolts of Greek philosophy fell in the, in the democratic cities of ancient Greece. Religion and myth are by no means annihilated by philosophy, but they begin to be questioned in a way that makes their interpreters and their transmitters responsible for them. And this, for Potochka, is the secret of freedom, namely that with it comes responsibility. If freedom for Potochka is a freedom for truth, and we know that it is, then we can conclude that with freedom for truth must come a responsibility for truth. And this may be the truth enclosed within the first democratic cities, the truth which the Platonic Christian tradition unfolds, namely the recognition that the possibility of authentic life is not just a matter of acceptance of the world or the will of divine beings, but of standing alone in the world, which is a, a whole, the world, uh, a whole that we have subjected to questioning. All this is a way of saying that just as the innermost truth of democracy may simply be that humans must become responsible for their cities and empires, so to the innermost truth of philosophy may be that humans must become responsible for their myths and world pictures their lives and lightning-like perceptions of the truth. Conclusion, the experience of history. To return to Oscar uh, Becker's typology of civilizations and to conclude. For Becker, history begins when humans become responsible for good and evil. It is an archaic consciousness of evil, a primitive guilt feeling which he sees in the literary fragments of deep antiquity and which permits him to see an intrusion of freedom in these so-called lower civilizations of Babylonia, Egypt, etc. For Potochka, the intrusion of freedom comes later and in Greece because history, like philosophy, is not a question of a mere consciousness of good and evil. Rather, History is a question of human self-consciousness regarding the knowledge of good and evil, which is to say of an intellectual self-perception of human responsibility for the world pictures which give meaning to good and evil. For Potochka, that self-perception uh, self of human responsibility is history. He calls it a shaking and he calls those who live through it the shaken. The freedom of the shaken is the experience of history. This experience of history is ultimately an experience of responsibility, but it is not a responsibility which humans merely or passively accept. Rather, it is a responsibility for which they take responsibility. Patochka calls it a free responsibility, and he insists that history is not intelligible without free responsibility. There is a sense in which, in Patochka's thought, the beginning of history, the question that he circles and that we've been circling in the first and second heretical essays, is not only a phenomenon which can be traced to the twin birth of Greek democracy and philosophy, he believes it can be traced to, to any moment of conversion in which any of us, in any century, face the eternal mystery of what is and wonder at the fact that precisely in this mystery, the world inspires questions that remain questions. History begins with questioning and history begins again when any of us enters into a freedom for truth, which is to say a free responsibility for the truth, when we choose to live unsheltered, when we tarry with the life-giving negativity of wonder, a feeling that reveals the limits of our knowledge. When we do this, we, de we decide to enter history, to, to see life as freedom, is to experience, in a real sense, for Patochka, the beginning of history. Human freedom shakes the pre-given meanings of myth and religion, and it is only after philosophy and democracy shake the archaic world picture and form of life that humans dare undertake new attempts 
at bestowing meaning on themselves in light of the way the being of the world into which they have been set manifests itself to them. This formulation at the end of Patochka's second essay introduces the problem of his third essay, which is titled, Does History Have a Meaning? Within that question is hidden a deeper one. When humans bestow meaning on themselves, as Patochka urges them to do here, can it be a real meaning? We will follow Patochka into that question in the next lecture. Mm -hmm.